You can now get Apple Music for free. What's happened with the UK parliamentary streaming probe and Taylor's re-recording her music. Stick around, we have a lot to talk about. Hello there and welcome to Music Industry Cities Tuesday Talkies, where we discuss what's going on in the world of music business. I'm Peter Schwing. Joining to me today are my co-hosts, Sam Tall and The Duke. If there's something you'd like to chime in about, join us in the chat or let us hear your thoughts in the comments below. It's all right. You don't have to be shy. We, we want to hear what you're interested in. So coming up on today's show, uh, Shazam is offering up five months free, uh, five months free Apple subscription. Radiohead and Elbow members call for better streaming royalties at opening of the UK pro parliamentary probe. And what effect will Taylor Swift re-recording her music have on her past catalog? We have a lot to cover, so let's get to it. So Apple has had many tie-in promotions over the years. Some went over well and others not so much. Anyone, anyone remember waking up with U2 on their phone? After a few weeks ago, we talked about the UK parliamentary uh, opening and inquiring about the streaming rates. So here with his thoughts on this is Sam Tall. Sam, how you doing? Hey, Peter. How's it going? So, so uh, yeah, there's, uh, you know, we talked about the, uh, the UK probe, and that's now starting to get a little more attention. And, uh, yep. you know, the Shazam op uh, offering up free uh, five, up to five months free. So what kind of effect does that have when it comes to actually, you know, if, if you're not collecting money, how are, are you paying the labels and the artists? Right. So I've come out in favor of user uh, centric payment models in the past on this show. I think it's the way that we have to kind of move forward in order to equitably treat independent artists. The problem is it presumes that uh, major labels and even large indie labels are going to want to change the deal. Um, it disadvantages them in some ways. Not big enough ways for it to be enough of a roadblock. This kind of gets into a larger philosophical debate of what corporate responsibility there is to uh, you know, make sure there's a ladder still behind them as they come up. Um, the thing with uh the shazam thing and, and this will tie us into the ongoing uh parliamentary inquiry into streaming economics every platform has done like a three-month trial right we're all familiar with a three-month trial whether it's free or 99 cents for three months or whatever the case may be family plans where you can have up to six users for 14.99 instead of one user for 9.99 college plans that are 4.99 or 5.99 depending international currencies, breaking into foreign markets, all of these have a net effect of reducing the average revenue per user. And this is a metric that uh, tells us how much each user on the platform on average is worth in a month or in a year, depending on how you frame it. Now, on Spotify, I believe it's somewhere south of $5 a month. What this tells us is even though the subscription is priced at $9.99, and this is somewhat true on Apple as well, even though I think it's a little bit higher because they're not freemium, they don't have an ad-supported model. Uh, even though the subscription price is billed as $9.99, the average revenue per user is under $5, less than half. And uh, there's a lot of reasons for this, but the impact is that just dilutes the royalties payable to rights owners. So... If you think $9.99 is being divided by however many streams and that's what those streams are worth, it's actually not $9.99. It's something in the ballpark of 3 or $4. That's why streaming rates are so low. Now, the streaming companies are playing a market share game. And this was brought up in, in Parliament the other week. Uh, they're playing a market share game. They're not playing a revenue game. They're not so concerned with revenue right now because they want to conquer the space. Apple has an imperative to migrate away from hardware and towards uh, services with their Apple One subscription. But even still, they're one of the most valuable hardware companies on the planet. Uh, and so they still have to mind that business. Amazon obviously can throw any money in the, in the world at any problem they want and, and find some level of success. Spotify is fighting to survive. And in order to do that, they need to keep the largest number of subscribers. And they don't need to necessarily concern themselves with revenue. They make a few billion dollars a year. They're hunky-dory. The fallout is with rights owners. So when Shazam, now an Apple property, 
is Apple's key sort of data funnel for what listeners are finding attractive in, in the music world and finding new and interesting. And they're going out and offering a holiday special, the five months of free service. Well, Apple's committed in the past when they launched, they committed to paying for trial streams. Previously, they said like, oh, well, it's free users. We're not going to pay for their streams because we're not making any money on those streams. And then they kind of reverted course. And I think Taylor Swift was part of the conversation of that at the time. Um, they're going to pay for those streams, but those users aren't contributing to the bucket. So they're just diluting the overall uh, level of, of revenue. And this is why user-centric uh, payment models are so important. My contribution to the Spotify ecosystem as a Spotify user is diluted by the people who are on free trials. I don't begrudge anybody getting a free trial. I don't begrudge Spotify running a free trial or any company running a free trial. You got to get people in the door. Spotify's free tier is their greatest funnel ever. It's like 20 plus percent effective, which is amazing for a sales funnel. And they make 90% of their revenue from premium subscriptions. So it's incredibly effective. The problem is my subscription being diluted, if I listen to largely independent music, it's the streams that I apply to independent artists that are going to be diluted more because of the volume sake, they're going to get less money than pop stars. However, if it were just my money applying to just my streams, applying to just that artist, they'd get all the money that I contribute to them with my listening time, uh, regardless of anybody else being on a free subscription or free tier. So this kind of would work for hi-fi services where people care about sound quality and care about the artists, things like Bandcamp if they wanted to do a streaming thing. That This is where I think that we have to go if we're going to support smaller artists, independent artists, and rise them up through the ranks to be major artists. And that's the principle of the uh, UK inquiry. Do you want me to just dive right into that mess? Yeah, just go go right into it. So – what happened was basically a bunch of artists as well as some uh, industry uh, experts, lawyers, pundits, things like that, speaking to members of the House of Commons about the idea that what artists need right now in order to survive, especially as the streaming uh, entertainment continues to grow, is this thing called equitable remuneration, which is a concept that basically just says it's not fair for artists to be last at the table to get served. You can't have money in the door at Spotify or Apple, then they take their cut, then it goes to the distributor, the distributor takes their cut, plus a little bit of breakage, which is still a thing in the digital era somehow. And then it goes down to the label, who obviously have costs. Um, and then, but I, I wager to say probably not 80 to 85%, you know, worth of the costs, uh, especially when they're recouping to the artists based on 15 to 20 to 25 percent artist royalty and not 100 percent of revenues received. So a lot of the uh, evidence provided and testimony provided to parliament was on the nature of the fact that this is how recruitment works. This is how this is the pecking order of who gets paid. And as an artist, I'm last and I get this much, if any at all, because I'm recouping based on 20 percent of overall revenues and not 100 percent. Uh, what can be actually done about that? I don't know. What can, and, and frankly, Parliament isn't quite aware, quite sure either. Uh, you know, they would have to be a government willing to intervene in international copyright assignment deals and royalty payment deals and all kinds of really hairy stuff that would impact on a global basis. I don't know that the UK Parliament is going to muscle up and do that. I think it would be hard to stand up in court and defend. That kind of government action of interfering in, in uh, private business. That said, I agree with everything that was said in that uh, t uh, those hearings, those proceedings. Um, I think it was a lot of smart people, and it's politicians who are trying their best to get it, which we can't say so much about for U.S. politicians. Um, and I look forward to seeing what comes of it. At least at this point, there is a spotlight on the issue that artists are – not uh, being offered equitable deals. It's kind of a take it or leave a you know deal with the devil kind of scenario, which we've all known for a long time. But you know, as independence becomes more and more viable, and as parties start to consider things like user centric payment systems uh, and and how they benefit artists in times of free trials and other incentives from the platforms that just already make billions. Uh, 
it'll be it's high time for this kind of conversation to happen and it'll be very interesting to watch it play out in the public space right on yeah we'll we'll keep our eye out on this one all right thanks a lot sam all right, we turn our focus now to Taylor Swift re-recording her old music and what effect that will have on, well, a, no, a lot of things, especially her the investment company that purchased her back catalog. To share his perspective on this, we check in with the Duke. How you doing, Dave? I think you're muted. You got the mute button on there? Hi, I'm back, yeah, sorry. All right. So, 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 talk to us about the, uh, you know, what you, uh, you know, the I, we put the article in the in the show notes. So, what what's your thoughts on this? Uh, my thoughts are very interesting. Um, I feel that like you know, it's important for artists to create their music, but the de the devaluing of music by outer entities is very interesting in our time. Um, I was in a party city and I heard somebody doing a blues traveler version, and um, it wasn't Blues Traveler. And I thought it was very interesting that a pretty big corporation like Party City would not be paying for Blues Traveler when it seems to be pretty simple. Um, Taylor Swift, you know, that that music is worth a lot. And, and um, you know, it was Justin Bieber's manager. He bought all that music, but he kind of did it in like a dark way where she's, she didn't want him to have that music. But he did it anyways because it was, you know, business. But so because it was such a dark move that he made, it's an action reaction thing in, in the world that everybody knows that. So now her next action is, all right, well, you bought this music. Let me devalue this music even further because I can easily re-record this music. And I'm going to tell all my fans not to not to buy the music. They are going to make new masters. So if you're the songwriter, you are always going to own your, your songwriting on the on song unless you sell that. But the masters, uh, you know, the label's gonna own it if they if they if they paid for you to create it. If they paid for the creation of the masters, then they're gonna own it. If you paid for it, then you'll own it. But it's so much easier now than it was, say, back in the days. Like if you were Sam and Dave and you and you recorded at Stacks, you know, hold on, I'm coming, it's like a classic track. Like that that existed on a tape. And for you to have all those session musicians and that plate reverb that was in that other room. That's a lot of energy to make that master recording. Now it's so easy to re-record something. So if you can imagine Cardi B being like, oh, okay, um, let's re-record Cardi B's track. Well, how are we going to do that, guys? It's going to be really hard. How are we going to get back in that zone? It's going to be very easy. You've got the same instrumental. If you need to re-record it, re-record it. Um, so I think it's very interesting that people can easily re-record their masters, and it, it devalues the, 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 the experience of owning a master from the label. Um, it just takes away all of that bargaining leverage, that all the leverage that the label would have to own that master. I did one thing with Salt and Pepper. I got a call from a producer friend, and they brought me in, and I redid the raps on Shoop um, for their new master. And I'm not—I don't know who the original dude that did Shoop is, but I, I can pretty surely say I don't, I'm not that guy. I don't look like him, and I don't sound like him. And they had me going through a cup to make that sound, but whatever it takes, they redid it, and now they're able to, you know, relicense that and own the license versus the label which would have complete control over that license. So it's a very interesting leverage shift in our time and day and age to, for artists to be able to re-record their masters and then do whatever they want with it. So it's a, it's a changing of the guard is how I kind of looked at the Taylor Swift and, and the overall thing of the music business and the re-recording of masters and the ease of it. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting. And you know, my thought is just like, you know, when when she wrote this these songs and recorded them i mean it was a different mindset back then so when you're re-recording it's like can you recapture that magic or do you you know the the musicians you know sometimes have that habit of saying oh i wish i added this to the song back then and then they they keep on adding all these things and it almost becomes a different song so you know while you know there there's some masterpieces in the catalog can she recapture that and would that be what is used f for sync placements and things like that or will her fans really want to hear some of her older songs with like this new spin on it um i'll give you two two perspectives on that one perspective is i've had a lot of good friends that have had hits you know in the 90s re redoing their masters because the labels you know have owned it for so long and as a producer as like somebody behind the scenes on that 
their effort was just to make it exactly the same as the original, like down to the nth degree, right? And at the same time as a listener, I don't know if you guys have heard, but you know, we're not gonna take it, the Twisted Sister, that's on a lot of commercials and that's not the original one. And you can tell because the vocal sounds just a little bit different. Also the final countdown, if you guys have heard the final countdown and Rat round and round, I've listened to Rat round and round a million times and that new one that's out in the commercials is not the original. Um, but they're doing their best to make it copy. Will they be able to do it, like you said, to get in that same zone? No, they won't. It's not the same room. It's not the same microphone. It's not the same year. It's not the same person. You change. But they're doing their best to make it exactly the same. And only like really uh, quality uh, listeners like us three will be able to tell the difference on it. But um, it is what it is. Well, I I, uh, I appreciate you throwing me in the understanding quality, but I didn't know that the final countdown and round and round were different versions. <laughs> so listen to it now. It comes on listen, I, you, now. You now I'm going to I'm now I'm going to hear it all the time. All right, thanks, Dave. All right, and that's it for today. Thank you all for tuning in. If you want to continue the conversation, leave a comment below. And if you find this interesting, hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell to be alerted about new shows. And speaking of shows, we have even more shows this week. It's Wednesday at 2 p.m. It's an industry news update. And then Thursday, New Thoughts with Stephanie Carlin. And then Freeform Live. That is uh, Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern. And that is a fun one. That's you get to call in. Uh, you join us in the chat and you actually get to be on the show. So uh, it's kind of like that radio call-in, but we do it with video. So check it out. Um, and you can also find us out, uh, find more of us at musicindustrycity.com or check us out on your preferred podcast player. Thank you again to my co-hosts. Let's see, where are my co-hosts? Here they are. There's my co-host, Sam Tall and the Duke. Have a rocking week. Peace.